you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. We head over to one of England's most overlooked counties, Shropshire, to discover some rather unusual and odd stories from this county. Joining me to educate us is the wonderful Amy Boucher, writer and researcher, and of course, proud Salopian. Amy tells us tales of grumpy giants, witches, ghosts, the devil himself, and gives us the lowdown on the marvellous tale of the Shropshire Man Monkey. But before we hear about the weird and wonderful Shropshire, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content and more. You can also click the link in the show notes. Thank you to my two latest patrons, Mary and Paul. Your support is greatly appreciated, as is all of you that support me on Patreon and make the show what it is today. Thank you, one and all. Mysteries and Monsters is on all social media platforms. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. And don't forget, you can visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, news and merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys. And Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's hear all about the weird and wonderful history of some of the strange characters that have inhabited the county of Shropshire. Nestled between the Welsh border and Birmingham lies the county of Shropshire, a rural and sparsely populated area of England. A scenic and beautiful county, it's often overlooked by its noisy neighbours, yet it has legends and lore that span centuries. From stories of the Fae, giants, shucks and ghosts, the county has plenty to discover in the company of Amy Boucher. Amy, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me. No, thanks for wanting to join me. It's always a pleasure. (laughs) As we were saying before we started, Shropshire, I think, is one of those counties in the UK that always gets overlooked. It's kind of pushed out and misplaced and people go past it or people go through it and nobody seems to stop and have a look around at this beautiful little place as uh, a local a salopian as uh, as they are known outside of their borders what's it like growing up in in one of those places that that people just seem to either not know where it is or act as if you've you've just suddenly appeared in the united kingdom when you're one of the oldest counties (laughs) we've got yeah um so i think i think it depends entirely on the sort of person you are um so someone like myself who i'm a massive history nerd i love folklore i love the countryside i absolutely i feel so lucky to have grown up in an area like shropshire um that really facilitated my interests um and I'm 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 a bit I'm a bit awkward. I don't like really being in a city. I find them quite like overwhelming. So for, I think if you're a bit more of a kind of city goer or you want a bit more kind of a nightlife, you might feel the struggle a little bit more. But it certainly if you're into all things weird and wonderful like folklore um and anything a bit spooky, Shropshire is the place to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so what came first? Was it a love of history that sort of led you into folklore and and magic and myth or was it a bit of everything or was it folklore that led you into history i mean sometimes these things work really well as you as we get older amy and we suddenly realize just how connected these subjects really are underneath it all so often one leads to the other or did they all just start in tandem for you um, so I think I always say that I liked folklore before I knew really what folklore was. Mm. Um, and that's because I grew up on these stories and a lot of the stories I still tell today. For me, all of my interests, my interest in history, my interest in folklore and anything a bit weird and wonderful has developed from growing up in Shropshire. So, for instance, 
Shropshire is a, a landscape that is really rich with folklore, folk tales, and also ghost stories. We seem to have more ghosts than, in my opinion, most places in the country. Mm-hmm. My grandfather was was a very good storyteller. Um, it, he wasn't professional or anything like that, but he would make the most mundane story really come to life. Um, and he would often retell us stories from the area. So, for example, the Reeking Giant or some of the stories of old scratch and he actually had an encounter with old scratch himself he believed um he uh, was said to have met the devil and he would take great pleasure in telling us these kind of stories so i grew up with a real appreciation for kind of fairy tales and, and and folklore without even really knowing it um and then i think with growing up in Shropshire, with being so richly there's a lot of heritage and there's a lot of history so you've got everything from the industrial revolution to the the medieval period literally just down the road from where i grew up so i i really developed a, a passion for the past and, and in particular the the people of the past the the way that human beings um interpreted the past and how they navigated the world in which they lived in. And then as I've got older, I think all of my passions kind of merged. And I, I knew that I liked kind of anything a bit weird and wonderful because I'm, I'm a bit of a goth. Um, and I knew that I was very passionate about the area that I grew up and our stories. And I love history. So it kind of all merged into becoming nearly knowledgeable. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's it's a mixture of it all, really. So did the passion sort of fire you up to, to start the blog and, and sort of look at bringing to light some of the stories your, your grandfather shared with you, Amy? Or was it one of those things that you didn't think that some of the stories or the legends or the history were getting their fair share of the limelight? Because as you say, I mean... Shropshire is is somewhere that has areas of natural beauty. It's got some of the most picturesque parts of the countryside in the in the country in that particular county. You've got breathtaking views. You've got wonderful folk tales about how the wrecking appeared. For a prime example, is is one which is is one of those stories that I wish I knew when I was dragged up it as an eight year old. I'll tell you that because it probably would have made me want to climb it a bit quicker. <laughs> so did you did you start the blog to sort of share your passion with the wider world about these particular stories or or was it just you thought this is this is the next best thing. I need to preserve these stories and get them out there. I think it was actually a bit of everything. It was a bit of a happy accident. Um, so I got to lockdown because I started it, it pretty much the, around the first lockdown. And I was working in um, the homeless shelter and it was quite a challenging environment. And I would really needed something just as an outlet to unwind when I wasn't dealing with the fact we were or, or dealing with the nature of the work I did. So I decided I wanted to write a book because I studied history at university and then I kind of packed my history and got on with the real world and started working in different environments. So I I knew that I wanted to share some of our stories. Um, For instance, the first blog post I wrote about was the Sin Eaters and how Sin Eaters um, have contributed to Shropshire. And I knew that I wanted to share some of our stories, but I thought I would like to do more general history and kind of discuss things like the Viking, which I had an interest in, or kind of Welsh history. But I found that whenever I sat down to write about things, if I was writing about Shropshire, I found it very easy to write. Whereas if I was writing about another topic, it felt like it was, do you know when you write in an essay for school and you don't really want to do it? It was <laughs> it was really bizarre. It was, it was like I wanted to write about early medieval Wales but when I sat down to write about early medieval Wales I wanted to do anything but it whereas with Shropshire it just came naturally to me and I think I noticed that the, it wasn't being represented in the same way that other areas are so there's certain areas in the country that quite rightly because they have in folklore get a lot of representation whereas Shropshire hasn't um, and that really from when I kind of clicked that that wasn't getting the representation served me to want to share these tales and ensure that not only are they preserved but also that people hear them because we have everything that any other place has and then we also have some really unique bizarre ones that kind of are brilliant in themselves and ca- encapsulate the idea that 
Shropshire's neither, I've always said that Shropshire's neither England nor Wales, but it's kind of both. Mm. Traditionally, Shropshire is in England and it's part of England, but there's so much of a Welsh influence that it's not quite England, but equally it's, it's not quite Wales because of the English influence, and it is a really fascinating place. Yeah, I mean, it could have been worse. I mean, it could be one of those strange situations where neither country really wants you because you're, you're either just over the border or just inside, depending on who's drawing the maps, Amy, sometimes. Yeah. And and so it's, it, it is difficult, I think, sometimes to untangle where Shropshire is these days, other other than the fact, yes, of course, Technically, it's in England, but like you say, it's it it is literally on on the border. It's on the cusp of the yeah. of Wales, and therefore it would make sense that there would be some pollination of of the legends and stories that would bleed across and and vice versa. So I think it does seem quite on. I think yourself and probably Herefordshire is another county that often gets overlooked. I think perhaps because they're smack bang next to Wales, so people either think they're Welsh or they just don't care. <laughs> I think it's it's geography as well. Like I, I I'm not very good at geography to be honest. Everything blurs. Um, for instance, I found out that Milan today wasn't in Spain, which was quite a shock considering <laughs> I'm teaching about the Milan and the plague tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but I don't think people necessarily know what Shropshire is, and if you don't know where an area is, you're not going to really know much about it. And I think through um, learning a little bit more about history and the history of the area even growing up there i didn't realize how important it was and how indicative it really was to british history so i knew that there were a load of castles there and i knew that the welsh were constantly trying to get into england through shropshire but i didn't realize that at one point the person that controlled shrewsbury for instance or wales was one of the most important people in the country other than the king because if you had them on your side they would keep the welsh out <laughs> if you didn't have them on your side there would be a clear route into england um during the medieval period and even little things like um henry the eighth we used to holiday in Ludlow sometimes and his brother before his brother died had his honeymoon in Ludlow castle so it, it just fascinates me how important this place has been in history and then how it's kind of gone by the wayside a little bit so that's why i've kind of made it my cause to share the stories <laughs> it is really because obviously like you say throughout up, up until probably the, the the 19th century shropshire was a very important part of, of england's history regardless of what aspect you look at it like we've you touched on earlier it was a key component of, of the Industrial Revolution. You know, this yeah. county did a lot to help drive the modernisation of, of England. And, and like you say, it, it is strange how places are so important to a certain point and they just fall apart, fall away from, from the, the forefront of people's mind. Or maybe it's because they've heard so many stories about the devil wandering around <laughs> Shropshire, Amy, that they've thought they don't want to go there. What's all this Possibly. about? Why why does the devil have a thing for Shropshire? What is it? So I think possibly because one of them, it's the best county in the country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think Shropshire and Mercia back when we're going way, way back into the Anglo-Saxon period was one of the last places in Britain to Christianise. So there was a lot of pagan influence in Mercia and in Shropshire was part of Mercia back when the kings of England and the, and the different kingdoms were actually Christian. And I think that residual paganism has created a situation where you've got some things that are not quite paganism, but also not Christian either. And it's that brilliant area of folk belief that still has Christian ideas, but they, they seem a little bit older than, than the Christian concept we have today. Um, I think as well as that, you've got things like the Methodist influence coming in from Wales. So in the 19th century, you have uh, a lot, particularly in my part of Shropshire, where I grew up, um, East Shropshire, with uh, places like Elford today, there was a lot of Methodists. Um, anywhere really there was a mining community, there was a strong Methodist influence. And Methodism sometimes can be a bit more hellfire and brimstone, and there's that real tangible idea of the devil being an entity you can fight and it that exists in your day-to-day -day business rather than being this massive evil deity so it's almost the devil becomes a bit more personified 
And I think as well, there's, there's certain areas in Shropshire that just give off a very otherworldly presence. And I think the best example of that is the Cypher Stones. Um, there's something very liminal and almost supernatural about the area. So you can understand how that feeling could inspire stories about the devil. I know when we were talking about when you first launched your blog, you mentioned the Sin Eaters, which I think for yeah. some people is is a completely alien term they're not going to have any sort of comprehension about who or what the sin eaters were or what they did ab so can you shed any light on these strange characters yeah of course so there's several arguments about sin eaters which i'll go into in a little bit um but the basic concept is if someone dies before they can have their last rites or anything really put in place for a christian send-off there's a belief that their soul might stay around and become a wandering ghost, which no village town needs. That We've got enough ghosts in Shropshire, we don't need more of them. <laughs> so what you do is if you know, say, for example, the vicar um, isn't going to get to the village in time, because several villages in Shropshire, particularly the ones in South Shropshire, would have one vicar to several villages, so he'd have to walk between on the poor hole. So if you knew that that was out of the question and he couldn't do the last rite, you'd get a sin eater. And a sin eater is a person that unfortunately tends to come from the lower ends of society, someone that's usually quite vulnerable. Um, they might have existing issues with, say, alcohol, who are homeless or they're living in poverty and they take on the job and the mantle of a sin eater in order to um, make some money essentially and it's a ritual that is almost a version of the the last rites in catholicism where they ritually eat bread and ritually drink wine or beer over the, the the person when they are either dead or close to death and this is meant to symbol, symbolically take on the sins of that person. So by consuming the bread, you're consuming their sins. And by drinking the wine or the, the beer, you're consuming their sins as well. And that was in order to let that person go to heaven and save the village a ghost. However, there is no sin eater for the sin eater. So that person who conceivably does that ritual multiple times in their lifetime have to know that they're going to go to hell and they are carrying around the sins of a lot of people. Now, there is only actually one mention about sin eaters in Shropshire. There's one reference from the 1700s. However, there's later versions of the practice being reenacted in the 19th and 20, even the 20th century. Um, there is an argument that says that perhaps it wasn't that prominent, but because the church had condemned eating, I personally feel that it probably did go on. It did happen. However, they weren't going to be screaming and shouting and writing about it mm. because the church had condemned it. And one of the reasons why I think it did happen more than we meant necessarily know is because a chap called Richard Munslow in the 1800s, later at the end of the 1800s, actually reenacted the practice. So it had gone into decline. And he was from Rattling Hope, which is also local known as Ratchup. And he was from Ratchup. He was a very wealthy man. He didn't really have any need for money or anything like that. But then all of a sudden, one uh, year, he, he started becoming the sin eater for the area. Now, there is a theory which I tend to believe that he did it to deal with his own grief because he ended up losing three children in a very short space of time, uh, two of which actually died in the same week due to illness. Mm. And I think that sin eating became his way of coping with the tragedy of their death. But for him to be able to reenact the practice and for him to be able to resurrect it, he's got to know about it in the first place. Now, it's not like Richard Munslow, he was a wealthy man, but it's not like he was a antiquitarian or that he was well versed in folklore it got to have been relatively well known in his lifetime in order for him to have brought it back so i do believe that sin eating may have happened more in Shropshire than we necessarily realize um but richard Munslow was the last sin eater in Shropshire, and sin eaters prior to him tended to be um kind of ostracised in the same way that a village might ostracise them. They would use them for their services, they would use them for the, the ritual, but they were condemned to 
suffered for the sins they'd taken on. They weren't allowed in polite company, and it was even seen as unlucky to lock eyes with a sin eater, lest some of that sin be transferred to you. So they were really quite ostracised and really quite lonely figures in society. And Richard Munzo changed that um, when he, in, during his lifetime because he was actually well respected in the community. And if you go to Ratchup, which is a lovely little village now in South Shropshire, you can actually go to his grave and it's still there. And he was buried with his children and his wife. So it was nice to think that they were all reunited after the death. Mm. It is kind of strange when you look at these situations, Amy, where you have people who do situations or assist the community with jobs that no one else wants to touch and then they kind of say well thanks for that now you can get back to to your cave out the way go on on your way we're not bothered about (laughs) you and and the amount of times you hear these stories about the power of people's eyesight or as you say locking eyes with them that even up until the 20th century there was so much mysticism attracted and attached to eyes that, yeah. you know, I'm sure you've come across this before where people would often say in murders that they would the eye would would take the picture of the person who'd committed the crime as the last image is almost the eye was a camera of some sort. So yeah. it's strange that people would consider that even sins that this person was holding in could be transferred in such a way. Fascinating, isn't it? And there's certainly references to particularly witches in the area having the evil eye. So um, old Dolly Edgemond, who was from Edgbaston, she was said to have had um, the evil eye, but she also liked wearing top hats and short skirts. So she seemed like she was a bit of a laugh. Um, and Nanny Morgan, she had the evil eye as well. And it was it was so scary that no man could call their soul their own when she was in her presence. And there does seem to be a prevalence of the idea and the power of, of the eyes in folklore which is fascinating Mm. when it comes to the history of of witchcraft around the united kingdom as we might keep saying there are quite a few notable areas up and down the the length and breadth of of the country amy what is the particular history in regards to that in shropshire was it was it widely practiced i mean as you touched on there about the the grave of the sin eater the the thing about shropshire is it's it's a very oddly populated county as well because the north of it seems to be where most people live the south of it is where you would think most people would want to live because it's stunningly beautiful it is isn't it yeah yeah so i think witchcraft has always been in shropshire and it's all been part of the daily life in shropshire probably more so than people in the past would like to have admitted so, for instance, there's a, t- a tale that Charlotte Byrne recalls in A Sheaf of Gleanings that she says that a vicar moved to the Clee Hills area, which is absolutely stunning. And he wasn't from Shropshire, he wasn't from the area, but he moved there, took on the parish, and then he was absolutely disgusted to see that there was a prevalence in the belief of witches and also in practices of witchcraft in the area. So he, he, he rushes home and, and he's going to write a sermon about the how evil witchcraft is. But he happens to tell the local schoolmaster and in almost wicker man style fashion, the local schoolmaster basically threatens him and says, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing that if I were you. Um, if you write a sermon about the evils of witchcraft and, and make out witchcraft isn't real, you'll make more enemies round here than you will friends. <laughs> so I, I think that's a snapshot into the idea of the prevalence of witchcraft. And there's even witches that um, exist into the 18th and 19th centuries when we're supposed to be, quote unquote, a civilised time with with industry and all that kind of thing. There's still a very strong belief in the power that these witches can have. Um, so, for instance, one of the latest ones I've seen is a lady known as Molly Delight, who lived at the foot of the Reekin, and that was in 1950s, and she was said to have the evil eye. She kept cats and toads, like every self-respecting witch in Shropshire, <laughs> and she was said to be able to turn into a cat as well. Yeah. And in all likelihood, that is probably just children telling stories about a slightly strange older lady who lives at the foot of the Reekin. But that belief in witchcraft and that belief in the existence of witches is still seen and is still prominent. And I think there's no witch that typifies that as much as Nanny Morgan in the area. So Anne Morgan was 
born, I reckon, around 1796 ish. And she was born into an area just outside of Much Wenlock. Nothing really to report of her early life apart from the fact she lived in quite a nice house. But then in the early 1800s, when she was working in service, she gets caught on the rob. Um, so she's been nicking from her the lady who owns the house with another girl. And she ends up going to prison for it. Now, she's come off lucky, to be honest, because the other girl ends up going to um, being transported. Mm. So Nanny Morgan ends up um, going to prison for some time. But she's kind of in a bit of a predicament when she comes out. Because she's been disowned by her mother and father. She's been disowned by the community because she's a thief. And she's not really got any prospects because no one wants to employ her. The area is incredibly insular, so everybody knows everybody's business. There's no hope of her getting a husband because she's a thief. Um, and it really causes her a lot of distress. So she ends up being homeless, and there's a threat of the um, workhouse looming over her. But then she happens upon the travelling community. Now, the travelling community, they do play quite a prominent part in certain aspects of Shropshire life because they would often come into Shropshire and work as itinerant workers. So they'd work on the farm, help with the harvest and then move on to the next farm. And she happens upon a group of those and she explains the situation and they welcome her with open arms. Um, and this is really the start of Nanny Morgan's life, but also the events that would actually cause the downfall. So she becomes a travelling um, woman and the newspapers report that she's taken to unchristian ways so one can only imagine what she gets up to she sounds like she's having a right good time um, <laughs> and she um, learns how to read palms and read cards and do tarot and curses and potions and really all the kind of trappings of the occult she learned during the time with the traveling community. Now, this gives her a means of supporting herself that she would never have got if she'd have stayed in the archetypal idea of what a woman should be in Victorian England. And she really loves it. She really enjoys the lifestyle she has. And she ends up being really good at it as well. Um, she disappears off the radar for a little bit, but then one day, unexpectedly, she waltzes into Much Wenlock, tells everyone she's moving into her dad's old house because he's died, and she sets up shop, essentially, in this house. So in this house, she starts selling her trade, and you've got people from all over Shropshire, and even people as far as Herefordshire, coming into Much Wenlock to have their fortune told, to read palms, to buy curses and potions from this woman. And it's not like they're even just superstitious country folk, like you stereotypically think. People and ladies of great standing and education that buy from Nanny. Um, and she ends up getting, as, as a lot of people who do this kind of thing, reputation for being a witch. Now, at first, you get the idea that that might have caused her some problems, but mm. then as time goes on, she starts to kind of play up to the stereotype, <laughs> So, which I think is personally brilliant, but she she keeps starts keeping a load of animals, uh, particularly cats, and she's got a few dogs, <laughs> but she starts keeping cats, and they've all got brilliant names like Hellblow and Satan's Smile, and my other favourite fact about her animals is she keeps a whole box of toads, and in this box of toads, she's got one that's her favourite, which she smothers in kisses in public and feeds communion wafers. <laughs> um, and but interestingly, it said that Molly Delight in the 50s fed her toads communion wafers. So I'm not sure whether it's actually part of a diet in Shropshire, but she, this toad eats communion bread and wafers. Um, but Nanny Morgan ends up being kind of a commodity to the area because they want her to be reading fortunes. But ostracized for doing the exact thing that they want her to do. Unfortunately, Nanny Morgan ends up being murdered by her toy boy, which in itself is it, it typifies the way she lived her life. Now, she lived with a man who was 35 and she was in her 60s, mm. and he was called William Davis. And William Davis was described by the newspapers at the time, at the time of her murder, as a, a weak, silly and inoffensive fellow. So it's really the character reference you kind of want. Um, and 
he, he, him and her are clearly, in my opinion, in some form of romantic entanglement or relationship. There is more than just lodgers. And the, they raise a few eyebrows in the community because people would rather believe that this wicked witch had seduced um, William, poor William, and him under her spell that um, than a young man could ever love an older woman. Yeah. But their relationship is pretty rocky, and it seems that there was um, they were very ill-fitted for each other, and there's, there's a lot of poor behaviour on each person's part. And one day, the 12th of September, 1853, she sends William into town with some of her money, because the money she makes from fortune-telling would make her be a very, very wealthy woman by today's standards. Um, so she sends him out to get some food for tea because she wants to cook a nice meal for tea. And William goes and spends it all in the pub. Mm. And then he, clever as he is, he staggers back home to try and get some more money for the pub. So they have this blazing row in the street and everyone, all the neighbours are probably person twitching. Um, and then the the argument actually spills into the house and that's when William murders Nanny Morgan, and he stabs her in the carotid artery and in the face, and she's got wounds to her wrist. She's in a terrible way, and she's actually passing away from her injuries. And tragically, it's said that only her dog, her dog is the only thing that mourns her in this world. So when they found her body, they found this dog refused to leave her side and was mourning and was howling and howling because his mistress died. Now, the interesting thing about Nanny Morgan's death, which I think really demonstrates our attitude to witches, not just in Shropshire country, is that rather than her being seen as a victim of domestic violence or a victim of, of abuse or a murder victim, she's seen as the problem and she's seen as the reason why she was murdered. So this argument, and it later gets used in William's defence, that she had bewitched him and he was in some sort of magical thraldom. And the only way that he could escape this was by killing her. Because there's an old belief that if you shed the blood of a witch, the witch will break you, it breaks the spell. Mm. So you think that this might be the sort of thing that might be being said in the street, but this was used in court and newspapers as far as like the Huddersfield Advisor and newspapers in Australia were reporting this murder case and saying that she was a witch and that she had had witched William. And it was almost it was almost a blessing that they had done this. And even people in the, the the town, such as the mayor, believed that she was a witch and that she was killed possibly for a positive reason. And he even took steps to stop her wicked books and her objects being brought into the local community or the town gaining a ghost. They gathered all of the things into the centre and burnt them. Oh. And it's it's shocking to think that this was the sort of thing that was happening in the 1850s because it feels medieval, it feels early modern, but this was happening 150 years ago. Um, and he did get sentenced to... He got sentenced to death first, but then it was changed to penal servitude and he got sent to Australia. And this is where the folklore and the real story kind of entwines because folklore says that Nanny Morgan got her revenge and she sunk the ship and he drowned. Um, but all we know is that he was sentenced to that. Um, but I think this story really shows the way we see witches in society, but also it, it challenges this idea that if a woman exists outside of the parameters of what's normal, she is somehow wrong or evil and I, I I do feel for Nanny Morgan and I wish I wish more people knew about her but also that she didn't have to die in the way that she did. Yeah. Is it one of those situations, Amy, where as we've become more learned and, and not accepted this kind of character assassination of someone just being a bit different to what people expect has she gone under some kind of renaissance that has allowed people to sort of celebrate her and and visit where she she lived and thrived or is this one of these things that it's it's only recently coming to light and and we're now starting to see a bit more progressive thought in regards to her and her history to my understanding it's only recently really coming to light so i i heard of nanny morgan growing up because i didn't grow up too far away from much wenlock thing I heard about her was that she was a wicked witch 
to seduce young men and she got killed, murdered by the man she seduced. And her ghost now stands on Westwood Common, which is near where she lived, seducing young men. <laughs> and if a goat man happens to look into this ghost's eyes, he will love no other but her for the rest of his life. And that was a story I really grew up and kind of accepted at first. And it was only really when I started looking into things a bit more detail um, in the newspapers, because I, I went through a stage of trying to match any of our ghost stories with newspaper reports or anything to do with things in the newspaper that I uncovered the story of this woman that was actually real for a start and that she and the, the full extent of it. And I think certain people have touched upon the fact that she was murdered or the fact that she was in the community, she was seen as a witch. But I think one thing I've really tried to do with my research is demonstrate that she was a person and that she even if it was against the norms of the time and she was a strong, fiery woman that cut her own path. She was still vulnerable. And ultimately she was vulnerable to the people closest to her and she couldn't escape that kind of weight of the patriarchy because by William murdering her it was almost in a way like the patriarchy catching up with all those years where she'd been herself and cut her own path so I think it's certainly coming to light a lot more now um, and I'm doing everything I can as one person to try and champion her and show that she would have been a fantastic person who she was a businesswoman she she run her own business and, and there's people nowadays that do card reading or tarot cards and make a, a tidy sum out of it and she was doing all that back then so i think it is interesting to see the way perception changes a person mm, yeah well, absolutely and i think as as we see it more and more in this day and age that there are some real sort of groundswells of support for for some of these horrendous cases and murders that were brushed off or done in the name of protecting the population and people are trying to get people posthumously pardoned and monuments erected for them amy so i think anything like that that allows us to look back in a proper sense and allow these people the credit they deserve should be should be supported and applauded so uh, let's hope that uh, her fight goes on long into the night hopefully yeah i never I feel like I've never escaped her. I feel like from the first <laughs> time I kind of realised that she wasn't just this wicked witch. She's kind of been there poking me, going, tell my story. Tell her. And she really, there's certain cases that I've researched that have never really left me, and she's one of them. Um, and I think they're always the ones that uh, need telling. They're always the ones that have kind of faded into the night a little bit, so we need to shout them and turn them into our cries. Mm. There is something about a lot of these stories in, in Shropshire that the reckon seems to be a, a, a real sort of centre point for a lot of strange things and strange stories. I love the fact that this hill that's not quite a mountain is, or rather has, two origin stories, which I find very odd, Amy, because yeah, yeah. although they both involve giants, they are very drastically different stories. Yeah, they are. Now, this is one of those things that, in the vast majority of, of England, we don't tend to get many stories about giants. There might be a few from Cornwall, and obviously Wales and Ireland and, and Scotland have lots of stories. But England seems a bit poorly represented when it comes to the world of giants wandering around. And yet Shropshire seems to have been quite popular with them. Well, most of them anyway, Amy, as we'll find yeah. out in a second. But do you think that's because of the proximity to Wales that there are stories of giants in, in the county? Or do you just think, it's once again, it's another unique aspect of the folklore of Shropshire? It would be wrong to suggest that Wales hasn't influenced these stories because you see, as you get closer to the border, there's a place called Ogo's Hole. And that's said to be a giant's burial. And it's, a, it's again, it's a smaller hill than the Reekin, but it's still a, quite a big hill with a cave underneath. And there's a story of this Welsh giant who has been buried. He's, his wife actually is buried in, down in this hole. Mm. And with her is a great treasure. 
and anyone that finds the treasure gets the giant's treasure and they're, well, they're, they're perfectly rich. And I think with the, with, the, with regards to the Reekin, I think the story that I grew up with, the, the one that I'm probably the best versed with, it, it would be wrong to miss out the fact that the Reekin giant is a Welsh giant. He's Gwendol ap Reekin ap Shenkin min mawr. My Welsh is terrible, but that's his name. So he's actually a grumpy Welsh giant who hates the town of Shrewsbury so much he wants to absolutely wipe it out of existence. So if you get really a bit esoteric with that all, Shrewsbury in a lot of ways was the centre of the power for Shropshire. It was the centre of justice for Shropshire. And it was also the gateway from Wales into England. So conceivably, the reason why the Welsh giant hates Shrewsbury so much is because it's blocking his way into England and um, that kind of thing. So I think <laughs> there's definitely a Welsh influence. And I think it's, well, I think it's probably the, well, the Welsh has influenced it, but it's developed into something a bit different. And that's through kind of our own perspective and we've put our own slant on it. Um, so I think that's certainly, again, the case with the the origin story I I it, the story is replaced rather than it being a giant it's the devil again <laughs> <laughs> so there is a version where it's not a giant that tries to flood um, Shrewsbury it's actually the devil and he's just had enough of the place so I think <laughs> it's wrong to say that Wales hasn't influenced it but there is, we've took, we've made our own slant on it and made it a bit a bit different a bit weirder <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the devil's a bit of a strange one, because obviously round here we've got Chesterfield, which is known for its crooked spire, Amy. Yeah. Which is also responsible, allegedly, by the, the devil's handiwork, who, who took a dislike to the area, rather than the fact that it was built out of the wrong type of wood. Anyway, <laughs> um, but it, it is interesting how that, depending where you are, there will be certain places where you'll have these strange stories. But um, I, I, love a, I love a story about a... Uh, a giant because it, it reminds me there's something about that particular story that reminds me of something else ironically to do with the devil who yeah. which, which does something very similar to this that this welsh giant who's annoyed with shrewsbury gets tricked by someone um which i think is one of those funny stories that you you stumble across sometimes when you come through to myths and legends about certain things that these giants are big and powerful, but they're not usually the cleverest of, of folk, yeah. are they? <laughs> yeah, no, they're not. Um, certainly not in the case of Wendell. He, he's, he's not bright. Um, <laughs> but again, it could even be seen as, as, as quite wrongly, a, a Welsh stereotype. It could be seen as people in Shropshire kind of going, you know, we're a bit better than, than the Welsh, even though there's a saying in Shropshire that's a Shropshire born, Shropshire bred, strong in the arm and thick in the head. So <laughs> it's kind of the idea we're going, yeah, we might be that, but we're not the Welsh. Look at them. Look yeah. at that Gwen, silly giant. Um, so I think there is something in that. <laughs> 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 there is also on the wrecking there is this wonderful pool which is is, is it called the raven's bowl because i've, I've seen the yeah. raven's bowl amy and this is one yeah. of these wonderful little th odd things that you'll find somewhere that on the top of the hill there's this little sort of spot where now i don't know if this is true or not but it, it apparently it doesn't matter how hot it gets it's always got water in it for some reason. Yes, supposedly. And if the water runs out, we know that there's a bit of a problem, supposedly. Um, I can't remember if I've ever seen it empty, to be honest, though. So maybe there is something in it <laughs> when I've been dragged through. Um, not too far from there, there was said to be a hermit that lived there in the uh, medieval period. I think, if I remember right, it was Henry III time, but I could be wrong. Mm. And he was meant to be so holy and so pious, this hermit. And it's called Gilbert, that the king actually wrote to the local magistrate and said, you know what? Let him do what he's, let him be him. Let him do what he's doing. We'll donate a bit of money to give him food. Let him carry on praying for God up on the hill. So there's, there was a hermit not too far from there. Um, there's, there's been a, quite a few hermits, actually, that have chosen the Reekin because there was one in the anglo saxon period as well um but this one had actual king sponsorship quite cool no half well that's that's if if nothing you can wear that as a badge of honor no oh, i can do what i want the king's the king said i'm i'm the best there is so hard line yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and once again shows the importance that people would place on on the county in the monarchy as you say with with all yeah. the 
people that have been to in and throwing through it and people having their honeymoons there. So it, it still allowed people to use it as some kind of important area for them in, in at any point in history, it would seem. That, that is very odd. Do you think it's because it's it's such a striking monument as well in regards to its surroundings in the area that places like that are often at any point in, in history Amy, you can go to certain parts of, of England and, and Scotland and Wales and, and Ireland that you will find these places that even though they're just perfectly normal, natural developments that have formed them for whatever reason, be it a cave or a or a gorge or a or a lovely high point in certain areas, that it seems to have some kind of magnetic effect on everybody that lives near it, that it seems to just draw certain characters to it. Yes, yeah, I certainly think so. I think if you look at the Reekin, like well, it's like what you said with maps. If you look at certain maps, I've, I've, there's one in particular that comes to mind from around the 1600s, and Shropshire's got Shrewsbury on it, and then I think there's maybe Ludlow on it, and then lo and behold, there's the Reekin, and there's a little hill drawn. There's a very jolly looking fellow stood there um, <laughs> on the Reekin, which I always think as the Reekin giant. Um, but I think when you are driving from Shrewsbury, for instance, or from further afield and you get to near the Reekin, it dominates the landscape. It's as, as far as the eye can see. And there's a saying which I think is very true to myself that a Shropshire man is in the lot if he can see the Reekin. And I think there's a real sense of place that's attached to it. I know my, with myself, the Reekin symbolises home to me. I grew up in the shadow of the Reekin. It dominated my my vision, literally. But also, it was kind of the axis of my own world. Um, I remember when I was a child, I didn't think anything could be higher or taller than the Reekin. <laughs> I didn't think there could be... You know, it was it was almost like Amon Hen or some something like something almost from Middle Earth to me when I was a child because <laughs> I love Lord of the Rings. Yes. Um, so I think we are very fond of our little mountain, and I think a lot of people attach the symbolism of home to it. And I think that if that's happening now in in the 21st century, that would have been happening. 300, 400, however many hundred years ago, that the people who lived around the Reekin would have seen it as important. And if you go back right up until kind of the Roman times and just just before with the Celts, there was people that lived up the Reekin. It was a hill fort. Mm. And I think you can feel as you, apart from the fact that you're really out of breath walking up there, if you're <laughs> anything like me, you can feel the age of the place and you can uh, you can almost imagine everybody that has put their feet on that ground and travelled the same route as you. And there's something almost quite pagan about it, really. is it's, it's a tangible connection to the history of the area. There is something quite awe I remember many years ago going to Scotland and we stopped in the, in the little place next to uh, Ben Nevis, Amy. And there's something... Well, I think when we live in this country, we're a bit sort of... You know, unless you live in certain areas... You, you probably you might see a big hill and that's about it often but there are certain places obviously in wales and and, and scotland and certain parts of the england as well where you will come across this i remember standing on the on the shores of the lock that's next to, to ben nevis just being absolutely awestruck thinking yeah. well, bloody hell that's massive and then thinking well if that's big how big is how, how big is a real mountain? You know, when you think about yeah. things like the Himalayas or the Alps, and you just think it, it is awe-inspiring, regardless. And when it's something that sticks out so far, that gives you such. And the other aspect of this is as well that on a clear day you can see for miles and miles and miles. You can see into other counties. Yes, you can. Yeah. So and it, it it doesn't surprise me at all that you would have these these magnetizing places for for people throughout throughout time and obviously now it's 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 extremely popular for for people who uh, who want to sort of see how fit they really are amy <laughs> yes <laughs> i think it's, it's interesting as well because in the 1800s we had these things called the reekin wakes now the reekin wakes were like a big celebration where everyone in the local community should be thinking wellington and conceivably maybe even the Iron Bridge area, would walk up the Reekin and there would be coconut shies and, and even fairground rides sometimes and as you get into the later 1800s and great dances and, and fizzy pop and all sorts of fun and merriment. 
and it would be at the top of the Reekin. And the Reekin Wakes culminated in essentially a massive brawl. <laughs> um, and this is, it, it's just one of my favourite things. Um, so it would farmers against all of the local miners and they would have this massive brawl to see who was the king of the hill right. and if one group looked like they, they were winning before the other group and before the crowd had kind of if the crowd wanted more entertainment and they, you know the one side looked like they were winning they would send some poor chap to run down the reekin run to the local area and gather up support for <laughs> people fighting at the top. So he must have had carves of absolute steel or iron to be able to do that. But it, it shows that this area has been more than a hill. And you see it even now, the certain days of the year that you'll meet every man and his dog and your neighbour and your old teacher and everything when you walk up the Reekin. And that would have been exactly the same 100 years ago. And I think that's what's quite special about it is that it's always been part of our community. Remarkable. I love the fact that you would just have a have a, have a really good day and then finish it all with a big punch-up. Yeah, it was grass. Brilliant. <laughs> but the, the local community, actually, the local community loved their Reekin wakes, but the people that owned the Reekin, because it is private land, was so disgusted by this behaviour and this ungodly, unchristian devilment that they would actually send people up to break the scrap up. But <laughs> unfortunately, there are some cases, particularly with some of the poachers that were sent up, where they just join in. Um, and eventually the reeking wakes were banned, but it is a practice that I think maybe the reeking could benefit from reviving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, have you have, have you uh, have your fisticuffs on the top of the hill out of the way, everybody? Go on, off, yeah. off you go. Yeah, go on. Farmers versus miners. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, if you're that annoyed with someone, if you can still have a fight after climbing up that hill, Amy, then fair play. I think it should be. You a must sa- be bloody annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you'd be that tired. You go. Oh, let, let's just shake hands. Let's move on. <laughs> Come on, let's, let's have a lemonade and go on the coconut shy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, one of the other wonderful, weird stories I've always been attracted to in in your locality is this very strange creature known as the (laughs) the Shropshire Man Monkey. Oh, yes. (laughs) So what on earth is this all about, Amy? Because I've heard about this and read snippets here and there over the years, but I've never really spoken to anybody who can give me the lowdown. What on earth (laughs) is the Shropshire Man Monkey? So... I love the man monkey. There are several theories as to what he could be, whether or not he is a spirit. And we do certainly have animal spirit in Shropshire. For example, there's everything from black dogs to phantom donkeys and phantom pigs. We've got animal spirit. Or he is something more tangible and a bit more like a cryptid. So we'll set the scene. In 1879, Charlotte Byrne, who is the absolute authority for Shropshire folklore in the 1800s, she heard reports of this event that happened on the Shropshire Union Canal where a man who was riding down the canal trying to get from one place to the other happened upon this strange snarling creature that looked a lot like a monkey. Now this creature leapt out from out seemingly out of nowhere really and attached itself to the back of his horse and was snarling and smiling and genuinely looked terrifying. So this man was absolutely terrified. The horse was terrified. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, So he he did all that he could really do with the tools he had at the time and started whipping it with his horse whip in hope that the horse whip would knock the creature off him Mm. and he could ride away. However, the horse whip went through the creature and the creature had a bit of a translucent appearance, which makes some people believe that it might have been a spirit. So he abandons his horse, abandons the horse whip and leaves it on the canal and he runs to an area that's nearby and it actually has a pub. So he checks in at the inn. He refuses to speak to anybody for a couple of days, absolutely terrified by what's happened. So the locals get a bit worried about him and they think, well, you know, there's this stranger and he's gibbering and he's he's a a bit of a nervous wreck. Let's get the police involved. So they get the local constable to come round and they're thinking maybe that there was an attack or violence, anything violence on the canal so they managed to calm man down and talk to him and he speaks to this police officer and he explains what's happened and then the police officer kind of scoffs at him and goes oh just that 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 always happens which is 
brilliant. Um, and he says that ever since a man killed himself not too far from where the man monkey was seen, this apparition, this creature had been um, forming and, and, and having similar instances. Mm. Um, so that's the first real instance that we have written down about the man monkey. And Charlotte Byrne went to the actual scene and she took evidence and she was very methodical in, in recording this story. However, some people have believed that it might be a bit more like a cryptid or an actual ape because not too far away in, I think it was 18... 18- 88, could be wrong on that date, um, in Birmingham, there was a creature, similar, similar, similar stories of this creature terrorising the community on the canals that was actually uh, tangible. It was, it was actually an ape, um, very tall, very large humanoid ape. And that story was called Old Ned's Devil. Now, mm. Old Ned's Devil was eventually shot and killed, which showed he was an actual living creature rather than a spirit and he was displayed in the local pub um, <laughs> so there's, there was some belief that maybe old Red devil could be the man monkey because the, the canals kind of touch but the, the stories don't in my opinion correlate and there have been sightings of the man monkey since on the Shropshire Union Canal my favourite is from the 80s where this family this poor unsuspecting family from I think they were from Norfolk <laughs> had decided to go on a canal holiday and they the canal and they were sailing down the Shroppy which is Shropshire Union Canal and it's absolutely beautiful there's a lot of greenery the dad driving the boat the children and the wife are in the boat and he looks up at one of the bridges he's about to go under and he sees this giant ape-like creature smiling and waving at him Mm. and he absolutely the blood runs cold fear in his body what have i seen so he, he shouts his wife he shouts his children to try and you know get someone else to see this creature but then by the time they've come out and gone you know what's wrong with you the creature's gone and I just love the idea of this almost reverse Bigfoot kind of wanting people to see him on the Shropshire Union Canal. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just think it's brilliant. But there have been a few other sightings of maybe grey shapes or dark shapes on the canal. But I think canonically, it, it's probably safe to say that maybe the Shropshire Man Monkey was a spirit entity in the 1870s, particularly with it being associated with a suicide, because there are other instances in Shropshire of suicide victims ending up becoming animal spirits. Mm. And there are several reports of that in Shropshire. But I do think, even if it is a cryptid, <laughs> that um, Old Ned Devil is a separate cryptid to the Shropshire Man Monkey. Um, <laughs> but it's just one of the brilliant bizarre little creatures that we have in Shropshire. For instance, in 2007, someone reported seeing uh, pterodactyls yes. flying over Whitchurch. <laughs> and um, she lived near a nature reserve, so she was quite well versed in birds. And all of a sudden, she heard this almighty screech, and she saw two great pterodactyls flying over her head. Told her husband, her husband probably was like, what on earth's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> Do I need to call someone? <laughs> and then two days later, her son saw the same thing. So she did a test where she looked through different birds with him. She was really quite young and said, you know, what's, what about this bird? No, it wasn't that mum. What about this bird? And then she popped up here of the pterosaur amongst the pictures, and he was like, no, it's that I've seen. Um, so they were seen in Whitchurch, and they were also seen on the Silken Way, which is in where a poor unsuspecting fellow was walking home from work and one supposedly swooped down at him um, and tried to get him. So we have dinosaurs too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always intrigued by strange tales of, of people encountering monkey-like creatures in the UK because the only other direct thing I can think of is that weird shug monkey creature that's yes. supposed to hang around in Cambridgeshire and uh, Suffolk, Amy. So yeah. when you hear these stories, along with that uh, that rather rather rude ghost monkey that's supposed to live in a stately home in uh, yeah. Dorset, yeah. Well, someone tell me. <laughs> so <laughs> anything like that always makes me smile a great deal um, because they are just so peculiar. Um, yeah, there's just no real reason for them to be. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not even like 
obviously there's the zoos and we've had contact with apes through things like that but it's not like we have an indigenous creature that could even look a little bit like that like there's nobody could that, for instance, for a monkey. Um, so there's no real reason for it to happen. It's just one of the beautiful eccentricities of this country. Yes. <laughs> that's that's certainly one term for it, I'd say. <laughs> um, I mean, when you've been diving into this, one of the other facets of folklore that I, I love is black dog stories, Amy. Yeah. Have you been able to uncover them? Because I know certain this is another thing like we're talking about the strange folklore of england especially that often when people look at it they'll say oh well everybody was telling the same kind of tales and i think sometimes it's very noticeable that there are certain counties when it comes to black dog law that have yes there is. hundreds you know when you talk about norfolk and suffolk and probably east yorkshire seem to have so many of them and then certain places like Wiltshire and Cambridgeshire there doesn't seem to be that many what Shropshire like when it when it comes to these kinds of tales so we definitely have some um I wouldn't say we have many as as some areas um and they tend to be associated a lot of the time with suicide so people that may have um suicided end up in some some areas, particularly Bath, uh, Bath Church in North Shropshire, they end up being um, black dogs. So there is an area, a road out, out, outside Bath Church, and there's this great black dog with fire red eyes that's meant to stalk the road. And there's some, according to folklore, there was a suicide that happened on that road or a suicide was buried at the crossroads there. So there's, there's that kind of negative association that maybe that, that very negative emotions that drive the person to the unthinkable could manifest in this creature. The Another one that springs to mind is Wild Edric. Now, Wild Edric has a whole heap of folklore around himself. He's got his fairy bride and he was um, a bit a similar to kind of Herod the Wake in the idea that he was fighting against the Normans kind of thing. But he is said to walk around the Long Mind in the form of a great black dog. Um, and he he's 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 meant to turn up as well whenever there is a crisis or there's a problem within England, and that can be in the form of a black dog or it can be in the form of a man. Um, so they're two off the top of my head, but we do have a lot of very strange kind of animal ghosts or apparitions. Um, so we have, for instance, the Reekin has an albino fox ghost not too far from um, the Cookies Cop. Um, and the Raven's Bowl, there's, there's this great, out, quite bigger than a normal, kind of, I imagine, I always imagine it'd be the size of kind of like an Akita, because it's described as bigger than a fox, much bigger than a fox, but this albino um, fox with fiery red eyes start to appear and then disappear, and there's even roads um, outside, on the outskirts of um, Welshpool and, and, and go, uh, outskirts on the way to Welshpool, the Shropshire side, that have ghosts of donkeys, and the ghosts there's one in particular that there's, there was a separation of a, a donkey lying down on the floor. And it was so real that the man who happened to be walking that way thought that somebody's donkey had died. Mm. So he went over to kick it. And just as he kicked it, it turned into a into an apparate, like a, apparated away. And it was it was dust into the ether. Anything. So we we do have several um, ghostly animals and they kind of are dotted around the whole area. But as far as black dogs are concerned, it's very few and far between. Oh, well, I, no doubt. I think if you keep digging into your your county's strange and wonderful history, Amy, I would not be surprised if more come to light, though. Not, Probably. <laughs> maybe that's not a good thing. <laughs> not too sure. <laughs> So is there um, is there anything that whilst you've been following up with this passion, Amy, that you've discovered about the county or your local folklore that's that's given you the the chills or, or you think is probably the county's most frightening thing you've come across so far? So um, I think it was an experience I had at Little Abbey. Now, I... I tend to be more on the believing side of the paranormal than sceptic, but I'd like to say I was a sceptical believer. Mm. But I always try and keep my personal views about the paranormal away from my folklore and my study of ghosts. Because to me, ghost stories are 
kind of a conduit for the attitudes and um, fears and the culture that they come from. And they can give us a window into the history of the time. Um, as Lilith Abbey has a haunted monk that is said to appear near the where the altar would be. And he, he if you go over to him, he's meant to rush forward to you and almost seem solid and ask you, have you found the secret mm. before disappearing? <laughs> Which is quite a cool story. Um, and I'd never really thought much. I'd, I'd written about it. I'd written about the actual, because the murder took place, supposedly, according to folklore, at Lillishall Abbey um, of one of the monks. But I... I didn't really think anything of it, to be honest. It wasn't one because I, I think because I grew up near Buildwas Abbey, which is is another abbey that has a spooky ghost monk. I'd always invested a bit more time in that story than the Lillishall one. But my, my partner and I, we went to Lillishall last year, and it just felt really weird. Do you know when a place has an atmosphere? And we were walking around, and for it was deadly silent. The muggy, um, un- almost uncomfortable days anyway, but it almost amplified when we were there. Mm. Um, and all you could hear was the wasps because it was a wasp's nest. And sometimes wasps have, um, it, one of the curses of being a, a folklorist is you tend to kind of link things, but there are an association with wasps and the devil. So I'm thinking, I'm there thinking that, but you kind of calm down. And I keep seeing something out of the corner of my eye and I keep like a black shape because one of the near one of the big archways and it almost looks like somebody wearing a hoodie kind of looking around the archway and then looking away mm-hmm. but there was nobody else there from myself and my partner mm-hmm. so we were walking around and my partner's a bit more of a skeptic than me so i thought i'm not going to make myself look silly and you know yes. ask him if he's seeing things i just carried, carried on um and then we got to one of the rooms it's a very very dark room it's only little little alcove really and I felt like I had a pair of hands stopping me from going in the room mm. and it was it, it 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 was only the only way I can describe it is it's like a, a very physical sensation rather than like oh something's stopping me going in here I felt almost as if you yourself had been stood in front of me or anyone kind of going no you can't go in here yeah whereas my partner could walk in mm. um and he felt which is very strange for him because he is quite skeptical Hand, almost like a hand brush his arm uh-huh. and um he he grew up in in like he went to catholic school and he grew up in kind of a, a semi-catholic household he doesn't practice so him being himself having a bit of a laugh he went hey oh you can pack that in i'm a catholic and he said he almost felt the hand go from being on his arm to moving and that freaked him out a little bit um because he's not really a believer so i couldn't go in that room um but we were walking around and I still kept thinking that I could see this shape, this black hooded shape in the corner of my eye. And then I said to my partner, I said, right, Callum, just stand there and look directly forward, almost like as if you let your eyes lose focus. What can you see? And he went, do you want me to be honest with you? And I was like, yeah, kind of the point of this exercise is for you to be honest with me. Mm. And he said, I keep seeing a black shape kind of looking. And I was like, right, okay, this is creepy because that's what I can see. Um, And I'd never really seen anything like that before. And we felt like we'd only been there about 20 minutes because, to be honest, it got a bit spooky a bit quickly. Right, right, let's go. I've had some pictures taken, let's leave. Um, And then when we actually got back to the car and looked at the clock, we'd been there over an hour and a half and we couldn't account for the time that we'd been there. And it was was very bizarre. It was almost felt very drained afterwards and, and a lot tireder and really quite bizarre feeling, but we could not account for that myth time so afterwards I kind of, I'm, I'm in the process of writing about the show for haunted magazine because mm. i want to kind of go into all of its history because there's they at one point in the 40s they were so convinced that there was something happening there that they actually floodlit it and they got the electric company to floodlight the area because they kept hearing screams and shouts and blood curdling shouts coming from the um underground it's got a series of tunnels underneath it um, so I'm, I'm doing my research, but I thought it would be good to, to put the feelers out a little bit. So I asked um, just Twitter and, and Facebook structure groups and anyone I could really think of as anyone had a, a strange experience at Lillishall. And the amount of people that had had similar experiences to myself and my partner or had seen things or heard things was really quite 
scary really because it made it a lot more tangible um and even there was there was people that had contacted me and said that um they'd gone there when they were in their teens with their teenage partner hoping to get you know get a bit lucky not to be too blue and then they'd gone and they'd seen a load of weirdos practicing magic and that is probably just people being pagan but yes. they said that it, it they didn't they didn't carry on with what they planned to do um when they'd gone there because they saw these people and they kind of drove off but it seems that this area Lushal Abbey it has a cool folk story but there's a lot more to it than just the folk story and it seems to have a real presence and I think if I was to put myself out on a limb and say it's probably the most haunted feeling place I've been to mm. um, because there's other areas and there's other places I think that have an atmosphere or you can you can quite easily see how the, the ghost story has developed from that area but Lillishaw Abbey felt different and it felt quite scary and quite dark mm -hmm. and then there was the physical sensations that myself and my partner had so it was it was just very weird <laughs> yeah. so i'd probably go with there wow i mean that's not something you would normally ascribe to a to a paranormal event this loss of time you would usually yeah. put that when we're talking about maybe the fae or alien abductions that's one of the first yeah. times i've heard of that kind of aspect of a haunting where you you completely lost track of time and yeah and we, so we cannot account for this time because we felt like probably maximum that we'd been there about half an hour because it was a quick kind of scoot round and then i think we both freaked ourselves out with the certain things that had happened so we were like right let's go because usually when my partner and me go to like other historical sites we spend a bit of time there we've been we've even been known to take like nine minutes morris or nafletaf uh, like viking and medieval board games and sit and play them in the actual medieval ruins and we certainly didn't want to do that at Urshel. um it, it was very <laughs> spooky <laughs> <laughs> well if, if something like that makes you want to leave somewhere amy i would suggest it's definitely haunted yes yeah <laughs> usually i'm like bring it on more the the better but i wasn't like that that day <laughs> uh, so along with your blog and, and as you've mentioned writing for haunted magazine you've you've also dipped your toe into the into the world of audio drama amy so how's that going and uh What's it about? It's amazing. Um, I'm I'm still a little bit in shock, to be honest, because I, I wrote this, I started writing it nearly two years ago now. So I had lots of versions of the script and getting to know the script intimately and, and even down to the last punctuation mark. But then to hear it come to life, it's a bit like, wow, this is this is something I did. What, what What's this all about? So it's a bit surreal, but it's amazing to see that people are enjoying it and are able to be exposed to Shropshire folklore in a new and different way. Um, so The Best of Men is all about the devil, believe it or not. I know that's, <laughs> that's quite shocking with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's centred around the Stiper Stones. So the Stiper Stones has a rock formation on it called the Devil's Chair. And the Devil's Chair is said to use it to sit upon and look over the whole of Shropshire. And on the 21st of December, the winter solstice, he calls forth all these most wicked followers, all of his witches and warlocks to judge them for the king of evil or queen. Um, and whoever's been the most wicked gets to be the, the most evil person, the king or queen of evil for the year. As well as that, it's also a time when newer people who want to be evil make promises to the devil and in turn get rewards from him. So it's a bit of a bargain in time, really. So there's a report of a chap who was a geologist in the, in the 30s who was said to have had quite a weird experience on the cytosones and he saw these people dancing and, and this inhumanly tall figure and it really spooked him. But then you don't really hear anything else. So I wanted to follow that story on and imagine how having such a paranormal experience would impact a person. Mm -hmm. um, so I followed his story through to his grandson and his grandson is Jack, who is one of the protagonists of the story, who is researching the, the devil in Shropshire to try and put a stop to him, he says. Um, not to give too much away, but he, <laughs> he, he tells people that he wants to stop the devil. Now, it just so happens that Jack is best friends with Britain's bad boy sceptic, who is currently the star lead man of Paranormal Takedown, which is the, one of the biggest 
paranormal shows in Britain and he's an absolute arsehole to put it bluntly um, he's he's in a way he I suppose he's like if Keith Morgan took the paranormal yes <laughs> he's not a very nice man <laughs> um, but the, the, the narrative really surrounds these three days before the solstice the idea and the, these, these devil narratives but the the idea that this TV show is going to take on the devil and um, I think it's I think it's quite interesting because a lot of modern paranormal shows are obsessed with demons and everything's a demon, particularly the American ones. It's this is a demon, this is a demon. So it's quite interesting to have that dynamic and play with what would happen if a paranormal show actually met a demon, actually met the devil. Um, So it's all kind of really about that folklore and how that folklore necessarily um, influences the area and the landscape. Mm, Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering what else you can, what other strings to your bow you can add, Amy, with everything else that you've got going on. So as as you've touched on, you're, you're doing an article in regards to your experience for, for Haunted Magazine. You're continuing to uncover things for your marvellous blog about all things weird in Shropshire and also this audio drama. Anything else? Any other irons in your fire at the moment? Um, so I'm very slowly writing a book on Shropshire Ghost. Ah. Um, <laughs> I've, I've not got any, how I don't know how I'll publish it yet or anything like that. Um, but I, I'm trying to collect all the lesser known stories. So they're all the stories that I believe should be told mm. in Shropshire. The problem is I keep uncovering stories and <laughs> I keep thinking they need to be told. Yeah. So that's why it's been slowly written. Um but that's something I'm doing, and I'm hoping possibly we might be getting a follow-on from the best of men because people seem to really like it, and mm. people seem to want to know what's happening next. So we're we're in me and the producer are in discussions at the moment about how we could continue the narrative, um, particularly because certain people might have sold their souls to the devil, so certain <laughs> people might need to go back in a year's time to. to <laughs> what the devil wants them to so that's really exciting <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant well amy it's been a real pleasure speaking with you and having you guide me around your county's strangest sites where can everybody follow your work find your blog and keep up to date with anything else you've got going on yes yeah. So I'm predominantly on Twitter. I don't tend to use many other social media sites. So I'm Goblin Egg on Twitter, which is, I love goblins, but the O for Goblin is a zero. My, with regards to my blog, my blog is nearlyknowledgeablehistory.blogspot.com. And on if you want to listen to my audio drama, for instance, that is, um, it's been produced by Alternative Stories and Fake Realities podcast. So if you search them, you should be able to find the link. And, and it's the best of men, my uh, audio drama through them. Um, and apart from that, I think that's pretty much everywhere you can find me. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'll put links to everything in the show notes for everybody. Thank you. And hopefully they will come and discover lots of wonderful, weird things as I have over the last two or three years reading your blog, Amy. Thank so you. thank you for being such a gracious host to your county strangeness. And I wish you all the very best. And hopefully when that ghost book's out, I'll have another chat with you and you can scare the pants off me in that regard. That'd be brilliant, yes. 